The sun is constantly in motion. Maps show that the plasma moves at different rates, in different layers. Red is faster, blue slower. Electrical particles are swirling around inside the sun, faster at the equator, slower at the pole, and that difference in motion produces the magnetism of the sun. And that can be studied at the McMath Telescope in the United States. At the heart of this observatory is a tube on a mountain with a mirror on the top. Don Jennings has come here to study the sun's magnetism. Though it never touches the Earth, that doesn't present a problem. The tube that that telescope is built in is supposed to be a very constant temperature. And so having it inside a mountain, it's like having it in a cave. The air inside the tube isn't as turbulent, and it gives a much sharper image. It has a, a mirror at the top that tracks the sun, and it sends a beam down 300 feet into the side of that mountain to another mirror that takes that beam and focuses it, forms an image right where we have our instrumentation set up. You can see the big sunspot and uh, what's amazing to me is that the sunspot in the back is two sunspots at this time, not oh, yes. just one. And how are we planning on mapping them? Dawn and Pedro Sada are magnetic map makers. It's a difficult job because the landscape and the sunspots keep shifting. Sunspots are places where the magnetic field is very strong and the activity on the solar surface is very strong. And we want to study the structure of the magnetic fields in the region of the sunspots and also see how it changes from hour to hour or day to day. To study the hottest body in the solar system, they must go to the other extreme of temperature. We have to fill our instrument with liquid helium and liquid nitrogen because there's a sensor inside the instrument that needs to be kept just a few degrees above absolute zero in order to operate properly. What you see is the, some of the helium coming out and causing uh, water vapor to form in the air. But this is not just smoke and mirrors. This is serious science. Don and Pedro cannot measure the sun's magnetism directly, but they can see its effects. The frozen sensor will be looking at infrared radiation from the sun and measuring minute variations in its color. Well, now are you ready to go? Don, do you want to put the filters in while I put the pinhole in place? Okay. Strong magnetic fields alter the color of some of the light from the sun. Don and Pedro know what the color should be, and by seeing how much it has changed, they can map out the strength of the magnetism around the sunspot. Okay, Don, I'm going to focus the camera so we can see the sunspot better. Okay, go ahead. Okay. They've built up a picture of how the magnetism okay. behaves around sunspots. The magnetic field coming out of that sunspot is almost like a fountain. It comes up out of the center very concentrated and spreads out. And usually sunspots come in pairs or maybe more. And this, the magnetic field will come out of one sunspot, maybe north pole, like in a magnet, and go into the other sunspot that would be south pole. Within the huge magnet of the sun are these other magnets. The sun's plasma traces out the magnetic field lines between North and South Poles. When the Sun becomes more active, the magnetism is more complex. Then the surface is turned into a carpet of magnetic turmoil. That's what causes even more sunspots to break out. The sunspots look dark because they're cooler than the rest of the Sun. 
spots form where the magnetism is strongest. The invisible force field diverts the rising heat away from those parts of the surface and makes them cooler. These are prominences. The lines of force act like invisible threads drawing the plasma out. They can hover above the sun for weeks. If you could stand near a prominence, you would see thousands of miles, perhaps, a, a loop that large with material flowing along the magnetic field. You don't see the magnetic field, you see the bright material. These are loops of gas that could stretch from the Earth to the moon. Magnetic field lines, when they form a prominence, are following a shape just like you'd see around a bar magnet. It's the same pattern. Often they start as small loops and they build up, and over a period of time they may disconnect, and material then actually flows out into space. A massive solar catapult hurls out millions of tons of particles. It may seem to be going slow, but this plasma is traveling so fast, it would cross Europe in less than a minute. Shock waves from a sudden violent release of energy. Like a pressure cooker blowing off, it releases some of the sun's pent-up fury. For a few seconds, a single flare throws out as much energy as the whole of the sun. For that short time, a flare can be the hottest place on the sun, even hotter than the core. A flare is activity, like a prominence or a sunspotted, but in this case, the activity is very strong and short-lived, and it's a brightening very rapid brightening over a period of minutes in which material is actually thrown out into space. The strong solar flares are actually quite dangerous because the flare throws out so much material in a short amount of time. We have disruption of radio signals, uh, we have satellites that may go out of operation. We actually need to know when a flare goes off in order to prepare for it. Solar terrestrial indices for 28 October follow. Solar flux 108 and Boulder A index 10. Repeat, solar flux 108. This is the National Space Weather Center at Boulder, Colorado. In the NOAA Space Weather Operations Center, we monitor the sun 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Boulder K index 0-hundred hours UT on 29 October was three, repeat three. Today, Courtney Williamson is the center's weatherman. Others plot and map the sun's activity. One of the things we worry about is solar flare activity. Now, these bright areas are areas of very strong magnetic fields. And sometimes these magnetic fields become very contorted. When they do so, they want to release their energy, and they do that in the form of a solar flare. Eight minutes after the flare, the Earth is showered with X-rays and ultraviolet, playing havoc with communications. In a solar storm, rays of energy burn the Earth's upper atmosphere. Then air expands, dragging down satellites that would normally orbit higher above. But flares aren't the only result of magnetic fields. Prominences may show up as bright loops on the rim of the sun, but when seen head-on, they appear as thin black streaks and they take on a different name, filaments. The dark features are called filaments. They sit higher in the solar atmosphere and sometimes they erupt from the sun. When they erupt, they make their way into the solar wind and propagate towards Earth. The solar wind is a stream of charged particles coming out from the sun.
our star constantly explodes, sending a million tons of electrons and protons into space every second. The first clue to the existence of this wind came decades ago, from comets. In 1986, Halley's Comet. Touched by the sun's warmth, its ice and dust boil on. Ten years later, the comet Hale-Bopp, seen with two tails, one a yellow trail of dust and dirt that litters the comet's path. The other tail, electric blue. It's glowing gas of charged particles like a windsock blowing in the direction of the solar wind. This tail always points away from the sun. But there are better ways than comets to see the solar wind in space. Satellites feed the screens at the National Space Weather Center. This is solar wind density, velocity, and magnetic field. They show Joe Kunshi's exactly how the solar wind is blowing. Right now, the velocity is around a million miles per hour. If it were twice that, we would be in a condition that we know is related to strong geomagnetic storm activity on Earth. Soho can see the storm on the horizon. With a disk in the center to blot out the sun's glare, it sees the particles that are blasted out from the sun. They strike the camera's sensor and sparkle. Blast after blast of electric particles will pummel Earth's magnetic field. It takes a beating, sometimes with devastating consequences for our planet. This computer image shows the Earth's magnetic field being blasted in 1997 by massive gusts of wind. A normally calm field, shown here in grey, rocks violently as waves of particles strike it. Blasts like these could cripple power grids. The wildly changing magnetic field acts like a dynamo, generating extra electricity. Circuits trip or blow. This was Quebec, Canada in 1989. This morning, six million people across Quebec woke up to darkness and disbelief. People of Hydro-Quebec are not positive, but they think the blackout was caused by the sun. Darkness for Montreal, but lights for the rest of North America. The particles that blacked out Quebec made it down to Earth and set off the aurora, the northern and southern lights. High-speed electrons cascade down Earth's magnetic field lines. Like electricity making the gas in the neon light shine, they collide with the oxygen in our atmosphere and it glows. Although the NOAA Space Ops Center has the most sophisticated solar storm warning equipment, they still need the human eye to see the subtle changes. Larry Combs watches the activity build up and knows we're heading for a major event. In just a couple more years, around the year 2000, we're expecting to be in the solar maximum period. We can expect a lot more features on the sun than we have even today. We can expect, along with those features, to have more disturbances uh, coming from the sun toward the Earth. Solar activity waxes and wanes. Every 11 years or so, its magnetic field twists.